Yeah, I'm Bob Randall, and I, I'm here at Mutichula. It's a very small community next to the monolith Uluru, and uh, I'm one of the listed traditional owners because of my family have always lived in this area, and uh, I'm a descendant of all my grandparents, and uh, I'm the child of the mother that was born just over on the western side of Uluru. I'm sitting in my little house, uh, on the eastern side, the sunrise side of Uluru. So when this policeman rode up in his camel and uh, the policy of the government was to take any half caste kids they saw, so when they were arresting my family for killing and eating cattle, they, I was the half caste boy there and they grabbed me at the same time. And then they put my family in chains and they walked from Angus Down Station to Alice Spring, uh, you know, nearly 200 miles. Yeah, about 500 kilometres today by car, you know. We do that now. And uh, So beyond the camel was my family and I was the little boy my auntie and my mother shared between them when I got tired that nursed me on the hip. But they had the chains, they was all linked up with chains. And why I know this, because I've got his, the policeman's diary, which I'll show it to you. You know, you can see for yourself. And we walked all the way in the hottest time of the month and just ended up in jail. And the same policeman who arrested me here, as my auntie said, because I was a little half cuss boy, and they were, my auntie and my mother was arrested because they were in possession of stolen property. They ate the bullock. You know, I don't know, I'd like to know how interesting it was when the court wanted evidence, you know. <laughs> they already ate it. That would have been a, something interesting. <clears throat> and, but of course, in the, they said they handed the half-caste boy over to the institution in Alice Spring. And there was hundreds of little sad, unhappy children there like myself. Mm, forced to wear clothes straight away. I, I never wore clothes in my life. So, of course, the first thing I did was every chance I had, I took it off and threw it away and buried it and, you know, and just, just didn't like it. Too uncomfortable. When you, when you haven't, when you're not used to these things, they are, they're not good as people make them out they're good. They're to a child who knew, didn't know them. I feel so sorry when I see on TV these little dogs being covered up with this material. <laughs> oh, I know exactly how you feel. Oh, and they try to tell their owners that they don't want that on. It's so uncomfortable. The owner's not listening to them. Same with me. When I was, I was getting out of my clothes, the, the people said, this is good for you, and they'd beat you up and then make you wear it again and tie it, try and tie it with a belt so you couldn't undo it, you know? And they just keep doing that till you till you give in, you're tired of the beatings, you're tired of the yellings. And when you're raised in a culture where uh, your mothers, who are your main carers, never yell at you, never hit you, you know, you go to a culture where there's carers who they believe were like your mothers, they believed in themselves they were being mothers, would slap the living daylights out of you. It was, it was really hard to live with. And it was so confusing, you know. And as we were totally mixed up kids, I think. And then, you know, I was taken, as you saw in the, what I talk about often, you know, a long, long way from my people here. And it took me years to come back here. The place where I was taken to was an institution run by the Methodist Church. So that's when I started hearing the stories about uh, Christianity and its teachings. The Methodist was teaching us that. <clears throat> and it was a bit confusing because they were talking about this beautiful way of being, but having difficulty of being that way. So there's a bit of a, hang on, <laughs> it's good for me, why isn't it good for you, you know? <laughs> God, he was saying, you would be, I'd rather believe you if you knew it was good for you and you were living it, you know? Uh, I'd really believe you, but I realised that when I started to 
it was very similar, especially when I uh, saw the similarities, similarities in the love that Jesus was teaching. When I started to read the Bible and I saw those teachings, that's really what attracted me about Christianity. I'm saying, oh, this is same like our teachings. Wow, this is so close to our teachings. I said, ah, this one, that, those Jewish people, they had it right. You know, that's where I saw. They were same like us. You know, that's where I saw the similarities. When I actually saw the, in, in the Bible, St. James, they have Jesus' teachings in red. And that, that's what I saw. You know, you could go straight into those words. And they st made more sense to me, you know, than the missionaries were talking, their interpretation with the way they were talking and the way they're too living. They made it more confusing than ever because I couldn't see them living the teachings. And I think that's the way most of us kids from bush settings like this would have had the same experience, you know. Because a lot of the churches took up, the Catholic took a big chunk of area and had a lot of kids, the Church of England did, the Lutheran did, and they were ration depot points to start with. You know, they used to keep us alive with the rations they gave us, uh, with the teachings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the regrets I have, you know, which I wish the church knew, they should have taught us real estate as well as, you know, the, the teachings. <laughs> I still say, oh, you should have taught me real estate. You've got no idea. Uh, if I understood that as well as I understood your religion, I'd be really well off now. <laughs>you felt really alone because the other kids were terrified to go near you or help you because they too was f afraid of being beaten. You had to get this access of connecting with the Sun or Earth Mother as quick as you could so that it could have a chance to comfort you. And you did it through these guys, through these trees, you know, through the animals because they gave you that same sense. And sometimes we just lie on earth and just said, oh, I've had it, I need you to hold me. Yeah, and it, she would. The mother would hold you. And sometimes she'd just say to the son, I need you to hold me, mum. And she'd hold you. We only had those two mothers. Our earth mothers were taken away from. They weren't there. The people who... Re said they were our mothers, the men who were our fathers wouldn't even touch us because of our darkness. But the two mothers, the sun and the earth man, they never ever rejected us, ever. And our family members, our brothers and sisters in the trees were always there. And that relationship is is so real to me that I never ever feel alone in the bush as long as I can be on the earth and I can see the sun I know I've got two powerful mothers caring for me and old moon <laughs> it too has its place it stands beside the two mothers just supporting their needs So even though I lost my f f physical rallies, I learned to trust and believe in the other greater relatives, you know, th through that connecting, through that, I'd say f faith would be a good word for it, because it is an dependent through something you don't understand but know it works, because it's not tangible, but it's so clear in yourself, you know it's real. Faith is depending you'll be looked after, even if you don't know what it is that's going to do. You know the planets? They didn't know what they were being pulled into the central idea for. What is your faith? <laughs> uh, As you I reckon I could align it with, with my Jukupa.
of the creation stories I love talking about, and, and, and Christ's teachings. So it's a sprinkle with those two. In that, especially in that faith area, he, he lived on, he, he taught on that. He spoke on that in the Bible. Yeah, and, I, and I knew what he was talking about. And I saw these guys just work things which people t say today was a miracle. I had sick patients here that white doctors couldn't cure. And one of my nunkries was come in and just cured. So I employed nunkries here when I was running the health service here. They were on my staff list because I knew whatever energy they were using, it very looked like faith. They didn't care much about tablets and cutting people open. <laughs> It was just this thinking, <laughs> it's accepting that what will be desired will come. The good will come from what you're wanting the good to be. It's like a form of prayer. Yeah, because when we live that, we live that. You could just, you, you just, as kids out there, you know, as kids may make silly mistakes. We don't have, take enough food to feed us for a week, and we we end up thinking we can go go and back there in a matter of a few days. And we don't take a week allowance of ration with us, so we run out of food straight away. So we got to live off the land. Now you got to go right back to faith for that. That the land will provide, and I reckon that took faith. It, when I start to understand what the word faith means, just believing in that what you'll have will be supplied by the greater energy source, which I don't know what was, but in my thing it would have been uh, Jugapa, and in my second thing, my Christian teaching, which would have been God, you know? Because it would have been either. Because I started to believe there was two energy consciousness there, and what we call it in our native state, indigenous state, and other people teach it there and have another name for it, it seemed to go back to that one beautiful consciousness, which I refer to today, which is so a living and so loving that whew, no matter what you want, if it's good for you, you'll get it. And how do you call that consciousness? I don't know, because it's a, it's a living thing. My consciousness is a living entity, like that idea that first started in that story of Chukupa. That consciousness or idea, the idea began, uh, was a consciousness. And I refer to the, call them, refer them to as the one and the same almost. You know, it came from out there, <laughs> just out there, and, and, and I, we identified it so quickly. There's something there that's, that's beyond magic because it's real. But if you're not careful, you can refer to it as magic, and it isn't magic. It's just, it's there, it's real. But you have to try it and see. In our spiritual belief system, both can be either can be separated if if, if you're not li if the physical isn't making the spiritual happy when they come together living life the spirit can leave, and that person then doesn't seems to be absent of something, you know. And, and my oh, if there's a child sick. Our, our uh, healers, straight away, especially our healers say, oh, might be that spirit not there. They will say that straight away. The first thing they look for to make is share, is, is the spirit with it or has it left from this child's behaviour. Margot, my, uh, my workmate, was in charge of the unit where I taught. We all had to, be, to teach cultural awareness to the organisations in Alice. <coughs> And her sister, she was minding all her sister's kids uh, and took them home for the weekend. The kids were all playing throughout that house while then. Margot's father was one of those dads who really liked playing with children. He liked to participate and chase them and tickle them and grab them. And, but he was hiding in the house and he was wanting to scare them, you know. <laughs> and he waited till this little boy started running. The turn was running past, and as he ran past, he jumped out and, you know, boo, you know, that kind of thing. And that little black boy turned white, you know. <laughs> really reached a level of high fear. And nothing happened. He just caught him and played with him, and everything still fun and level. And uh, then the auntie came, and then the mother, her real mother, came and picked all the kids up on, on Sunday evening to go back. 
at home. The next day, her sister rang up and said, Billy Boy's sick. Something's wrong with him. He's not well. And he, he got really ill last night, I tried to sleep, that we had to really run him to hospital. He's in, in the ward now. He's up there and the docs are trying to find out what's wrong with him. And they can't see it, but they reckon he, he's deteriorating, whatever it is. It's something he's picked up on the weekend or anything. And we don't know what, what happened. Then they can't find out what caused his illness. And uh, so they said, we need to, will you meet me at the hospital tomorrow? to help the doctor in finding out what caused that little boy. And they said, you know, what, what do you eat in the meal? All those type of thing. It's anything unusual he may have taken, you know, to make him ill. They couldn't think of anything. And once again, they all went away hoping he'd get better, the doctor trying different sort of medicine to uh, help him get well. And then the third day, which was Tuesday, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, but Wednesday they, they said, he really seemed to be getting worse. He's, uh, but when we've tried everything we know, we try to see if we find out what's the cause, but he's getting more worse. And uh, one, of the, one of the sisters said, has anyone started called uh, Nungary? Nungary, Uncle Stephen, uh, Nungary here? And they said, no, we forgot. Oh, well, someone sent for him, so they rang him up and got him in to come in from Santa Teresa. And when he came in mid-afternoon, this Aboriginal heel, and he walks straight in, he says, the spirit's not there. What happened? And they told him the story. And then he said, take me back to where you had him for the weekend. Because he worked it out. If he got sick Sunday night, then something must have happened that weekend. And the doctor said, I want to come with you for this one. I'll, I'll give you a lift. And he, he offered the lift and the family. And the Margie and the mother went back with the doctor and this nunkery went back uh, to the house and they said he, this is where he was for the week in the yard. That guy walked outside in the yard first thing, you know, went around. Walked, just walked out, just normally, as though he's looking for something. And uh, then he walked through the house and he went to this place where the vegetables were stacked, the onion and potatoes in the kitchen. And he looked, ah, and he went over and he, he picked up a child. And he said, I'll take you home. And he was nursing this, this, this child. And the doctor was there driving him back to Alice Spring Hospital. And then he went upstairs, put the two boys together again. And the boy started getting well. You know, a lot of modern people are looking at energy healing and they're certainly going the right way because it can be the absence of the spirit, especially if you do things which you shouldn't be doing. The spirit will excuse itself before it's meant to. It's supposed to stay till death do us part. You know, it's supposed to, but it can leave sooner if you if it's a person. It's it draws back or away the more uncomfortable it feels from the action of the desires of the physical, it'll make itself absent. Yeah, that's, that's our culture. So we have these healers or nunkries who, who, who look after that side. Amazing. The first uh, time we were there, the first evening we arrived, someone picked us up at the hotel and, and took us out to this teaching to listen to the students share the experience they had with their Kanyini camp here. And honestly, what I saw was a really stupid way of living, you know. And I don't know why people chose that way. Oh, you know, if it, or oh, they, oh, I still don't get it. But it, it, it doesn't allow them to be part of all that there is. You know, it kind of separates them from it. E even to the people, we were in a traffic jam, you know, and there's one drop a human being in a vehicle that can carry five human beings. And 
it it just makes sense if they just just talk to each other and said, "Are you going to there? Or are you going there or near me or by way? Are you?" And they could just cram. They could have eliminated heaps of those cars. Every fifth car could have been taken off that highway. We say all well, we'll probably we say, the roads only went certain directions, and there's a lot of suburbs off those. You know, so they really got the answer not to have traffic jams and not to pollute the environment and to restrict the way they're misusing, abusing resources that are getting limited all the time. And that is in the first few minutes of me being in a car waiting for this traffic to lessen. <laughs> one car after another, one person driving it on the same road, they were all on the same road, going in the same direction. <laughs> I said, and we are the smart ones? <laughs> You've got to be joking. I said, all the teachings uh, of how to live in, uh, it, it comes from these, these, this country, from the bush. From whenever, and it would have been like that in the city when they first arrived there. Those there was Aboriginal people there. They could have easy have listened and seen how beautiful the country was. They're probably putting their drinking out of the Arrow River from the from its bank, swimming in and out of it. You'd be terrified to do that now, you know. Oh, poor Yarra River. I was imagining it, you know, before any of the development there, how clear and blue it must have been. Mm. Just thinking, because I went to the very top of it one time when I was in Melbourne, and it's really clear, you know, the water up there. And you can still see little fishes, you know, and little water creatures living in that same water. What happened? What happened? In our culture, everything is living. Even the changes of the uh, the, the temperatures, we say, you know, th that is a spiritual living entity, and. You have relationship in the human form amongst my people who are related to the cold air, the hot air, the water, the fire, the wind, falls into their relationship line of kinship. And if you have those guys living with you, they'll talk to any of those entities to tell it or ask it to do certain things for it, and it will. It's quite it used to be, when I was growing up, it was quite common for certain people in my community who had relationship with these uh, natural energies, and you'd say, no, no, it's too cold, or oh, just ask Tommy. Go and ask Uncle Tommy, that, that wind is a bit cold. And Uncle Tommy will tell that wind, that wind will warm up, you know. It was amazing. That communication was so easy. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw a storm coming when I was in Darwin. This is a really good example because it is in the wet season, you know, wet from the, this huge storm coming in from the east into towards Darwin. And these guys were gambling on the railway line, just playing cards. And I walked over from my little house to get some milk and bread, me and a couple of my children. And I, you know, and I just said, "Hi, guys! Crumbs! It's going to be a big rain soon. You can see this big black." low belt, you know, coming <laughs> slowly. Oh, uh, yeah, that's all right. Yeah, we know. Yeah, you know. And they kept playing. Then I got my shopping there, which was only half a mile over that way. Then I'm walking back to my house and they still, and the storm now is almost on top of us. And they said, and I said, hey, you guys better run for forget shelter. Because I didn't know where they'd go, where they'd run to the shop to get a house or they were living in the caravan park over there or where? I just couldn't see any 
car near them whatsoever. And they said, no, we're right. And they, they said to this guy, I'll just call him, uh, you know, uh, Johnny. Um, Johnny, that, that, that rain is going to be here soon. You go fix it. And he got up and he looked at it and he said, oh, OK. And he walked over just away from the group and he started talking to the rain. That rain came and then it just parted. Better no more than 100 yards, 50 yards from where they were sitting, and went round them. It divided itself, went around, and came together another 100 yards, half a kilometre or half a mile down again, and flooded out Darwin, <laughs> to, which was to, to the west again, beyond where these cars were. And they just kept playing. But half a mile to a mile around that area, it didn't touch the ground. Get outside of that mark. <laughs> it was like full puddles of water. <laughs> and those kind of things happened throughout my lifetime. And I, I grew up with people having that kind of ability. You know? And that's where that understanding of that relation to all things, and we're just part of that, was, is a reality to me. That brown skin baby song came to me when I was, again, I used to work on an airways, a McRobinson Miller, uh, Miller Airways used to be, uh, Ansett Airlines used to be a competitor with the Qantas, which is the only one in air, uh, which was second airline you, that you could use. And um, I was working for them for a couple of years and, uh, <clears throat> and I was flying over Arnhem and looking down and I used to always look for the circle of rainbow with the shape of the aeroplane and it's like a cross. And because I was a Christian at that time, and which I am now, I, I used to really like looking for that because it gave me a peaceful look and you say how beautiful the world was that was created for everybody on it, you know. I'd see it like that. I used to look at it like that. And uh, I was looking down and all of a sudden there's an empty chair right in that aeroplane. This little, and, and it felt as though somewhere then I looked and there was no one there, but then I got a song for you. You know, I got a song for you, this voice of that once. Like a, like a thought. Uh, get your pen and paper. And I just leaned back and I opened my briefcase, got pen and paper, and, and I just wrote that song that I felt was being given to me at that moment. And I sort of related to when I went home and sung that song with the words and the guitar chords, you know, straight away on the tune straight away and with the tears, wow, running down, you know. Because the first time I, I was reminded of the way, way I was taken and uh, uh, I, I sang it when I got home that night, you know, with the people and the effect it had on everybody there it was just beyond anything I imagined. And, uh, and I started to feel okay that I, I was dealing with this experience which I think must have been bottled inside me, you know. And I was trying to release it by when I sung the song. And other people were releasing their tears when they heard me singing the song. That it, uh, and I always acknowledged that my mother came to me and gave me the song. Because it comes like as though it's from a mother had to tell me the story about their loss of their children. You know, that's why I wrote it, Brown Skin Baby, They Take Him Away. Oh, I like that, and uh, and it's exactly the same words I got at that first time. It I sing it today the same way. Oh, uh, Look about I'd like you to sing the song that you would be with. I'd love to sing that song. Yeah. Yes. Brown skin baby. Take him 
away As a young preacher I used to ride A quiet pony round the countryside In a native cab I'll never forget A young black mother her cheeks all wet Yahweh Yahweh My brown skin baby they take him away Between her sobs I had a say police been taken my baby away from white man boss that baby I have why he let him take the baby away Children's home, a baby came with new clothes on and a new name. Day and night he would always say, Oh, mummy, mummy, why they take me away? to go from a mission home that he loved so to find his mother he tried in vain upon this earth they never met again So we're going to make a portrait of you. Well, when I show the portrait to other people, what would you like them to know about you? That he is a man who loves you.